Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to a panel to talk about investing in America, or actually not to talk about investing in America, because some of you may have turned up and think we're going to be talking about the Inflation Reduction Act, think we're going to be talking about various bills and measures to get more infrastructure spend, et cetera, et cetera. And the answer is we're going to touch on that, but actually, we're going to talk about something that I think the vast majority of people at Aspen have not yet understood, but they need to understand, which is what is actually going around on around the Biden administration right now is a very, very big stealth zeitgeist shift, if not an intellectual revolution. And you may say, what do you mean by that? And the issue is this. The last time we saw a serious intellectual revolution in the way that policymakers think about the economy was really good morning America, the Reagan era, when the world woke up and embraced the concept of free markets, neoliberalism, all of those ideas about Chicago school economics, et cetera, et cetera. That was Reaganism. What we're seeing today potentially develop, and I stress potentially, around Biden that most people have not understood at all is potentially another big shift in intellectual thought and the policymaking framework, which does not yet have a name, but I think in 10, 15 years' time will be viewed as significant in terms of how it's redefining economic policymaking as the shift of Reaganism. And things like the IRA, things like the debate around supply chains, are just one tiny tip of the iceberg of the shift that's going on. So, we're going to talk about this shift, which doesn't yet really have a name, and I say is only beginning to materialize. We're going to talk about what it means for infrastructure, environment, trade policy, many other things, what it means for financial markets, and talk about whether it's really going to take off or not, and what on earth we should call this shift. Patriotic capitalism, Bidenomics, um, socialism, if you are a left-wing person, although I'd argue it's absolutely not socialism, but we're going to talk about what we call this shift. And we have two fantastic people to talk to us about this. Heather Boucher, who is part of the Council of Economic Advisors around Biden, part of the team that are formulating these new ideas. Um, she was previously working at a think tank for a long time in Washington, and before that did her PhD in her academic career as an economist in New York at the New School. We've also got <clears throat> someone who's probably known to many of you, Jean Ludwig, who was previously um, the controller of the currency, but he's also worked for years as an advisor to much of Wall Street through Promontory. Many of you may know that group. Um, very distinguished long career in providing advice to financial sector companies. Um, he's also, however, come from the think tank world himself and done a lot of work on looking at prosperity and what it means to build inclusive economics not something necessarily you often get combined with a Wall Street background and pedigree, but he's going to tell us a bit about wh how and why he's working on new metrics, new ways of managing economic policy as well. So two people at the center of this. I should start off by saying that purely by chance, um, <laughs> we all turned up wearing navy blue today <laughs> without any coordination whatsoever. So take of that what you will. But perhaps I can start with you, Heather, and say, I would imagine that most people sitting in this room have absolutely no idea either who you are or what you and your group around Biden today are trying to do. Can you give us a quick elevator pitch about why your approach to policy making is not just another set of economic bills, but actually trying to do something much more ambitious intellectually and think, rethinking many of the orthodoxies that have dominated in places like this for the last 50 or 40 years? 
Happy to. Um, that's a big question. I'm, and I'm going to try to make this pithy. You know, one of the ways that the president talks about these ideas um, is he talks about building an economy from the bottom up and middle out. And he contrasts that directly with the trickle down economics of the Reagan era. And that's a lot of words. And our challenge right now is that when you are moving from one set of ideas that have dominated economic policy for half a century, almost half a century, to a new set of ideas, um, we don't have the words yet. So, um, so I hear your challenge. Challenge, but it is it is part of the crafting of that new economics, that new understanding that we are living right now. Core to these ideas are the following principles. Um, first is the idea that um, investing in America and the people in this country are the best investments uh, government can make. And core to what we do is that ensuring that um, as we're thinking about economic policy, what we make in the United States and how we make it matters. It matters for our economic success, success as a country. It matters for what growth looks like across the country. Is our growth strong? Is it stable? Is it shared? Is it sustainable? Um, so the what we make and how we make it are the two guiding principles. So the president um, and the team, you know, and especially coming out of the pandemic, we've spent a lot of time thinking about what are the critical industries that are imperative for our success, for our competitiveness, for growth, for communities across the country, for resiliency, for our national security. And we've made some decisions, right? We know that um, investing in new technologies like semiconductors is absolutely critical. But we also know that the existential challenge of climate change requires that we invest in clean energy solutions and that we do so at scale and as quickly as possible. So absolutely critical industries. We also had a couple of other industries, the care industry, for example, that, were on, that are on our agenda that aren't getting as many investments as we would like, but also identified as core industries. And then how we make it. What are we asking those industries to do? This is how we create growth in our society. Um, and so there are, you know, an, uh, I think of really four guiding principles there. One, we're investing in people and places across the country, tapping into the talent and the um, opportunity. We're focused on resiliency. For too long, economics has just focused on efficiency and not acknowledged that resiliency is core to economic success. And I'm gonna pause here for a moment. We're focusing on how government shapes markets. One of the things we did in the first year of the administration was a whole of government executive order, one of the things the president did, was this whole of government executive order around market structure and competition. And that may sound really wonky, but markets, these amazing things that can deliver all these, all the, the things that we buy and need, they, they are all shaped by our public actions, by how government is, is um, the, the rules of the road. And, you know, a hundred and some odd years ago, the United States was at the forefront of breaking up concentrated markets to create opportunity for small businesses, for workers, for communities, to ensure that those markets are fair. And that is the third principle of this, is making sure that we're shaping markets in the public interest so that it works for communities, for workers, we're creating those jobs with dignity, and that we are not creating the negative externalities of emissions and environmental damage, but that we're shaping markets to be fair, competitive, and um, focused in these good directions. Directions. And then finally, doing also doing all of this in collaboration with our trading partners and making sure that we're setting up a global uh, trading system that works for Americans, for the American economy, also works for the world, but also pushes us towards our shared goals of national security, economic security, and quite frankly, above all, um, the need to bring down emissions. So what we make in America and how we make it matters. And therein lies the paradigm shift because that unpacks assumptions that underlied um, economics for a long time, that we could just let markets do whatever they wanted and everything would turn out okay, or that we didn't need to care about the composition of industry, or that we could just focus on redistribution without focusing on how we make things. Right. Well, thank you. Um, and that is a very pithy elevator pitch. I would imagine that probably a lot of people in the audience are sitting there saying, well, hang on a sec. I kind of liked Reagan. <laughs> I kind of liked what he did with markets. It did me pretty good. Um, a lot of what you know I've heard about Biden sounds like a lot of government meddling, if not socialism, to use a tag thrown up by a lot of Republicans. Um, and yet, one of the things I find fascinating as someone who trained as a cultural anthropologist and is used to looking at tribal patterns and zeitgeist shifts and intellectual frameworks, one of the things I find fascinating about what's going on right now is that much of what you're saying about what I call patriotic capitalism 
one might call it protectionism, one might call it common sense, was actually stuff I heard from the Trump team. And I was yanked in to the, to, you know, the Trump White House quite a few times and had lectures about supply chains and lectures about essentially why you couldn't rely on markets to make things because you had to make sure it was made in America in a secure and reliable way. So you've got this peculiar intellectual shift going on on several fronts. That's why I think that, you know, if you're looking for a word from it, patriotic capitalism might be the way to talk about it. But Jean, I'd like to bring you in here because, you know, you've seen many cycles in Washington um, and you've been part of them as well. How do you evaluate what's going on around the Biden team right now? And why has it been so badly communicated, in my view, to the wider public? You know, is it because Joe Biden isn't always as, always the slickest um, communicator? Um, is it because it's still being formulated? Is it because we've also got a tribal shift going on in terms of the economics teams in that what I used to call the Rubin tribe, the Bob Rubin tribe that dominated the Democrats for years, it was either Bob Rubin or his group, um, you know, that were linked to Wall Street, they've now been essentially edged out and a new tribe is in town who are developing these new ideas. But why do you think this hasn't been communicated better and how significant is it? Well, I think <clears throat> Jillian has very good questions and a lot to unpack there. I think there are really three reasons. Um, uh, number one, we're living obviously in this social media world where there is an enormous amount of noise and uh, it is very hard to basically sift through the noise and to you know, figure out exactly what's going on, who is saying what that's real and, and you know, what isn't real, particularly where there is a um, a direction that is a little different, that runs counter to what I've been hearing and what I've been reading. And, uh, you know, uh, for a long time we have been fed that the way to advance is only free markets, free markets, free markets, which of course, like everything else in the world, is more new and nuanced than that, right? You know, there is no 100% free market in, in any society, and certainly not this one. So one, one reason is the noise. Um, and uh, particularly if President Biden wins a second term and there's enough time here, I think one will see this becoming much more au courant what it is. It doesn't have a buzzword, I think it's fair to say yet, but I think it will garner its own buzzword. The, the second reason I think this, what I will call new industrialization or, a, or an industrialization policy hasn't caught on is because one of the things that has been really wrong with the way we view America, many of us, is that the headline statistics and a lot of the other data that we look at has unfortunately been a misleading. Now, that wasn't intentional. The government doesn't give out misleading information intentionally. But in fact, um, you know, we, common sense would say something's wrong here. You see all these homeless people, and yet supposedly we're growing 2% a year, and supposedly unemployment is 3.7%. So what's wrong? Well, they, the fact is that the definitions for a lot of these headline statistics, I think virtually every one, were formed in the 1930s out of concepts of the 1870s, and they're just simply out of sync with the world we live in. And though the basic data is fine, the data that we're you know, ingesting comes from these headline statistics. Let me give you an example. A a a the uh, unemployment rate, 3.7 percent. Well, if you filter that number, just filter it, for the number of people that want to have full-time jobs but can't get it, and maybe only working one or two hours for the past two weeks, we count them, we at the Ludwig Institute for Shared Economic Prosperity, we count them as functionally unemployed. Um, Secondly, there are people who are, whether they're working full-time, mostly they're not, they're part-time, can earn above a poverty wage. That is, a poverty can't put food on the table, can't have a roof over their head. We count that group as functionally un unemployed. If you look at that, 22.5% of the American people today that are trying to get a job, 22.5% are functionally unemployed. Now, we don't think of it that way. So what, what you're 
try to do, Heather, with these reindustrialization is something that's running counter to what people are saying to you. They're saying, well, everybody's employed. What do we need to reindustrialize? We got 3.7% of the people. So, so that's, that's the second reason. And I think the third reason is that the current narrative, which is built off a misunderstanding of where we are for middle and low income Americans, is that the biggest problem we face is inflation. And it's a misunderstanding of, of the problem, in my view. And that also pushes us out of the heart of the narrative, which is we don't have enough good jobs, people are living on the street, they can't feed their families, they're very angry because that is middle and low income Americans have been sliding for 20 years, and we're not quite hearing this because we're not hearing it because what we really have to worry about, so the pundits are telling us, is inflation. So again, it's misdirecting uh, our view away from what is at the heart of the problem to what's the periphery. And I think it makes it very hard for Heather's uh, message to uh, get currency. But over time, it will get currency if we have enough time because, in fact, it's real. It's, it's telling well, America what the real scoop is. Yeah, you can just see, if you look at what's happening in terms of manufacturing investment in the last year, it is like a hockey stick shot. How many of you in the audience have seen the data on manufacturing investment in the U.S.? Okay, if you haven't seen it, I'd say go back and Google it after the session because what you literally have is, you know, for the last 20 years, it bubbling along like this, going down, 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 down. You know, America losing manufacturing, hollowing out, blah, blah. In the last year and a half, it has literally hockey sticked up, gone like a, that's not a verb, is it? It's gone up like a hockey stick in the most extraordinary way. But Heather, I can see you about to jump in and comment on Jean. Well, I probably had a question. I mean, uh, so many things. I mean, I, I mean I, I'm glad you brought up the, the rise in manufacturing. Um, you know, we've seen uh, over $470 billion of new investment across the country in new manufacturing, semiconductors, battery plants for, you know, the electric vehicles and um, energy production all across the country, inspired by um, and driven by the investments that the government is making in creating this new economy. And I think it gets to a couple of core questions. I mean, one, we, we're at this moment where I think folks on both the left and the right acknowledge that what we were doing for, I would argue, half a century, it wasn't working. 50 years of rising economic inequality, 50 years where the wages of the average production worker weren't keeping pace with productivity. That's, there's something wrong in a system that isn't, deli that is delivering all this growth, but it isn't actually, it's not trickling down as, as we were told in the 80s, and it's certainly not benefiting communities across the country. We live in a country where, um, you know, our life expectancy is falling relative to other developed economies, especially for young people. What's, what's wrong? We live in a country where we didn't have that resiliency in our supply chains. Saw that so viscerally during the pandemic. And of course, we've not been able to address the challenge of climate change in a way that acknowledged what industry needed to make that shift. Everybody was afraid of climate change. Oh, it's going to cost all this money. Oh my gosh, it's going to lead to all of this, this the horrible economic outcomes. And instead, we're creating jobs all across the country disproportionately in red states, in states that didn't vote for President Biden, but who are out there so excited about these investments. And it gets to the kernel of it, which is that most of us get most of our income from having a job, right? The vast majority of Americans get the vast majority of their income from the job that they hold. And if that job isn't delivering or there aren't jobs in your community, then you're, you're up a creek without a paddle, right? So what we're focusing on is creating the, in, the, the ecosystems for, in, for industries that we believe will be the competitive vanguard for decades to come. We're making it possible for those industries to thrive in this country to create those good jobs. And I mean, I will just note, you know, uh, it, it's exciting to see this happening all across the country and people being excited about that tangible effect. Right. I mean, one of the reasons why I wanted to, you know, I know this is all a bit heavy for a Sunday morning, um, particularly with the sun, sunshine outside, but one of the reasons I want to stress this zeitgeist shift is because even if you're sitting in the audience right now thinking, actually, I don't like the sound of it, it sounds like socialism under another name, I like Reaganism, I like free markets, you need to understand this because Oddly enough, some of the people I know who are most focused on this right now are Silicon Valley venture funds who are pouring money into green energy infrastructure and investments um, because they've realized how this zeitgeist shift is beginning to develop slowly. But um, 
and I'm going to create lots of time for questions in a moment for those of you who want to say why you do or don't like it and ask whether it's all just about higher taxes. Before we do that, though, the <laughs> I'm sure, I think that probably cuts quite well here. Um, the Rubin tribe, and I call them the Rubin tribe with deepest respect for Bob Rubin, but he did re reflect, you know, a certain group often emanating from Wall Street who were centrist left, who dominated democratic thinking for many years. The Rubin tribe would say, this is all very well, but actually we believe in free trade. We don't like this protectionism. We don't like this supply chain stuff. It's going to be super inflationary. What would you say to that? Well, so here's the thing. Having fragile supply chains, also very inflationary. So let's just start there. When you look at the inflation that's happened over the past couple of years, so much of it was due to the shocks across our supply chains. Um, you know, and we saw that take semiconductors, for example. The, the fact that semiconductors are in, are in almost everything we buy now and that we don't make them, um, we used to, but now we don't, they're made overseas, that made us vulnerable during the crisis. It led to higher prices for all sorts of things that we buy because when one, because, you know, during the pandemic, when one factory closed, we couldn't get what we needed. It affected the whole economy. Um, and I would say the same thing with clean energy. We need to make this transition. But right now, there's, you know, the problem with clean energy is there's not enough of it and it's too expensive. It's a classic supply problem. So we are investing on the supply side. And let's be very clear. I want to take on the socialism thing for a moment. Um, and I think if I was, if Bob was here, that, that, that it would be a good thing to take on. That we are investing on both the supply and the demand side. We're giving consumers some credits to make it cheaper for them to, to, to um, purchase clean energy, and we're making it possible for um, firms to make those investments and to make the changes they need to make in their factory to use clean energy. Because without that, it's too expensive for them to do it, and they're not going to supply enough, and then it's going to be too costly for us to buy it. But by the end of this year, electric vehicles are projected to be cheaper than regular cars. And they're also more fun to drive and they're quieter and they don't smell of gas. There's all sorts of like positive things there. But, you know, we are, um, you know, when you think about the, the rise in prices, we know that the things that cause inflation, um, you know, rises in energy prices. This has been, you know, one of the core facets of inflation for decades. Well, we are trying to make energy more stable, more secure, more cost effective through these investments in clean energy. And we need to do that through creating an international trade regime that does not leave us vulnerable. So here's a fact. OPEC controls about 40%, 4-0, of the crude oil supply around the world. And every one of us knows how much control they have over US prices. China controls 80 to 90 percent. That might be Bob Rubin calling to join I in. bet it is. <laughs> um, uh, China controls 80 to 90 percent of many, many parts of the clean energy supply chain. That is a chokehold on this supply chain that is the supply chain of the future. We have to unpack that. We have to make ourselves more resilient. This is classic Econ 101. Mm -hmm. Econ 101 says competition is good. 80, 90%, that's a concentrated market where one actor has a lot of market power. This isn't, we aren't against trade, but we need trade that is fair and open and competitive and benefits people that live in this country. We cannot allow um, uh, we cannot allow concentrated market power to dictate what's happening. And so, and so here's the thing. We're in a little bit of a hole now. So yeah, we're going to have to dig our way out. We're going to have to change things up. Change is always hard, but we are doing everything we can to make it the least costly. And there's, um, I think the, there's a, a lot of evidence that we're making a lot of progress there. Let, let, yeah. let me uh, 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 try to defend my, uh, my tribal brother, Bob Rubin, here a second. <laughs> Bob no, I'm not in any way attacking I mean, just, the Bob. I'm not attacking he, he's Bob Rubin. sitting right there. He's <laughs> the, uh, uh, but uh, and, and also say a word about why it is so important with he what Heather is doing and the president's doing. Um, the fact is that when you go through all the numbers, which I could bore you to death with today in terms of where middle and low-income Americans are today, we have seen a slide since the Reagan years of middle and low-income Americans such that their economics are less good today than they were back in the Reagan administration. And uh, that's through the whole group. And oddly enough, it's actually the lowest quartile that may be a little better than the highest quartile, but that's still 
all poor. So let's start with that. Just assume that what I said, I can prove to you. That and of course, your, your think tank, those of you who want the numbers, your think tank can drown you in numbers. <laughs> drown you in yeah. numbers. We want to start out with the facts. So how do, we, how do we dig out of this hole? Well, we dig out of this hole by doing just what Heather and the President are suggesting, which is we invest in new technologies, new businesses that basically can uh, give real jobs, real living wage jobs for Americans and give back American leadership, including the importance of infrastructure. Now, what runs counter to that a little bit, and this goes to the socialist business, is, oh my God, we got deficits, 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 we've got inflation. So how on earth can we do that now? I want to take you back to that socialist, I mean, we, we, wanted, we had a socialist president, his name was Dwight Eisenhower. <laughs> now, <laughs> Eisenhower left the Second World War with the highest debt to GDP ratio in 100 years. Highest debt to GDP ratio in 100 years. So what did that socialist Dwight Eisenhower do? And what did they do in that administration? They invested in America. Mm -hmm. And so we had the Highway Trust Fund, we had the electrification. There were a huge amount of programs basically to get America back on track as a producing entity. Because if we don't produce, if we don't supply, if we don't have enough food or energy that's coming from our own hands, what happens is we do have inflation because you get choking off not enough goods and services for the people who want them. But if you're actually producing enough food and energy and jobs, you get exactly the opposite. So what Eisenhower understood was, God knows, all kidding aside, he was certainly a capitalist, right? Uh, uh, and markets work. But every now and then, markets need a little bit of a boost. Uh, as a former regulator, uh, and I think everybody in this room, however much uh, you believe with me in free markets, and Bob Rubin certainly does, uh, is that, I mean, uh, it, uh, certainly not uh, uh, anti-free market as the former head of Goldman Sachs, uh, that, um, that markets need to be regulated too. Uh, uh, we can't have a financial market without sound regulation. And frankly, no financial executive worth his or her salt w would say that we don't need some level of regulation. Now, us regulators can go too far. That, that's true, and we can actually not hit the mark all the time. And I would say that, though I'm very proud of what we did in the Clinton administration, wasn't perfect, uh, life evolves. What's going on now is a change. I think Jillian is very wise. It's very astute to say we are going through what is a major shift. I would think of the shift myself as back to the future. Mm -hmm. You've all seen the movie Back to the Future, pretty much everybody. This is a little bit back to the future. Absolutely. That's why I went back to the Eisenhower administration. Coming out of World War II, we had an environment, and, and there's some great books on this. Jacob Hacker has a book called Amnesia that discusses that issue. Uh, he's a professor at Yale uh, in the uh, political science department, that uh, we had a, a shared bond between business and the markets and government. And that bond has frayed over the years, frayed in the Reagan administration. Uh, and so this is back to the future in more of a shared national purposeful direction is what Heather is doing. And I think it'll get right. its own name and own, but it's a very important shift. I mean, the thing is though that, of course, one of the reasons why Eisenhower could do what he did was because they came out of World War II and there was a sense of a wartime economy. Now, one of the bitter ironies of all this, again, as an anthropologist is observing how the tribes and the patterns and the intellectual frameworks, you know, um, evolve, is that, you know, the reason why the Trump team were the first people to sit down and literally put a huge great document on the desk with a thud about supply chain concentration and vulnerabilities and why they had to basically race to start protecting American supply chains. That was the Trump team doing it. The reason for that, of course, is geopolitical tension. So the question I have for you, Heather, is that is it rather convenient that we're heading into a war footing in America right now in terms of trying to marshal people's you know, resources and make them understand the need for a rethink about the relationship between business, um, society, and government. I mean, no one wants a war, but at least it's creating a kind of break point, which is making it easier to jump in and start saying, we need to invest in supply chains in America. I think that the, I mean, 
it is certainly the case that the national security considerations are front and center. Um, uh, but it is also the case that, I mean, and I, I think in my mind, it is, it is so, it is so wrapped up the national security issues and the, and the energy issues. These two have been wrapped up for all of time, right? And you, um, because how we power our economy is everything. And I mean, just as a sidebar, I remember when I first started, you know, I'm an economist and people talk about energy economics. I was like, oh, that seems really weird and boring. But the more you kind of, if you just start thinking. Well, not to half, half the room here, I've got yeah, no, it's interest like, in tech. Texas, so yeah, you know they're not bored by this the, stuff exactly all. no but it's it is it is when you when you unpack that that is it is literally how we power everything it is so core to national security and um, when you watch the way that you know, as other countries are, they themselves trying to make sure that they have control over whatever assets and production they need to produce energy, that we need to be doing this. You understand, there, I mean, there's a deep connection between the national security concerns and the economic security concerns, um, and why I think clean energy is certainly at the core of that. But, you know, we, we have been so careful throughout the administration to make sure that we are um, focused on the fact that we need to be resilient, we need to focus on what on building these, these this environment for industry here at home, and we have also been working with our allies. And I think that you um, that often gets, gets lost in the conversations. One of the first things we did in year one was the global arrangement on steel and aluminum, a race to the top to make sure that we are making those um, uh, products in the way that is most um, energy efficient. We pull down emissions, but also making sure that we have access to the supply of steel and aluminum that we need in order to be both nationally secure and to be able to be um, having the race to the top, encouraging a race to the top between us and Europe to, um, to, to keep emissions down. Or the work that we're doing right now on critical minerals, which is trying to ensure that as we move to this new world, where we're going to be fighting over access to mineral, hopefully not fighting, but you know, com competing over access to, to minerals instead of oil, that we're doing it in a way that is good for our economies and our societies, that we're front-loading labor standards and the environmental issues, but also making sure that we're creating that, that, that that global trading regime so that we can have access to the things we need. Right. You know, Jillian, I thought you really focused on the right thing when you're talking about communication. And uh, I hope you as, uh, you are the editor of the Financial Times. I'm not the editor of the whole of the Financial <coughs> Times. I chair the editorial board. Chair yeah. the editorial well, board. Pretty big, big, <laughs> big stuff. Pretty big stuff. Help get that, the, the message out because I don't think we need a war to, yeah. uh, because we're, we're in a way domestically on a war footing. And here's what I mean by that. We, we cannot see uh, this country go much further in the decline in middle and low income Americans without having a very, very difficult uh, you know, uh, society. You can't do this forever before the society comes apart. There's nothing better than a middle class for bringing a, a democratic society together, and there's nothing worse than having no middle class for pulling right. apart. So we, in a sense, that's the, that's the big war. And, and in a lot of ways, there are a lot of you know, uh, factoids that are uh, really damaging where we are today. This um, uh, inflation thing is a big thing. We're focusing on it the wrong way. Uh, I, the way to focus on inflation cannot always be raise interest rates, so you basically stop the economy, put more low and moderate income people out of work, uh, put them on the streets, have more tents. This cannot be the way that we constantly decide we're dealing with these problems. All of a sudden we've decided there are these three bad banks that failed, right? Anybody who's an investor in the audience will know that these three banks, the ones that just failed, Forbes and Fortune and everything, they were the three right. best, most exciting banks in America a year ago. Yeah. So you have to ask yourself, what's going on here? And I think what's going on here in part is a misunderstanding of the basic economics as to where we are and the need to basically come out of this with a much more you know, upbeat, energy you know, uh, reaffirming effort to build the country. And, and that will help on the inflation front too. So and so build, what Heather's yeah. doing is critical. Just build America. Build America. Even yeah. dare I say, make America great again, but mm. with a twist. <laughs> um, but, I'm um, not putting on my course, red hat. Of course, one of the issues, I cannot, I cannot express strong enough the irony of sitting there in the Trump White House, you know, all those years ago and being told, you know, all this stuff and then suddenly fast forward and hearing it again from the left. It's, it's you know, 
very striking. Of course, one of the ironies about the Fed, just very quickly, is that out of Reaganism, out of free markets, came this orthodoxy in central banking that what drove inflation was demand, 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 not supply. And of course, the story of the last two years has been supply. And raising interest rates to cope with the supply problem is probably not going to work. But anyway, that's a separate issue. We're not talking about central banking, although mm. I am fairly passionate about this. I'm a geek. Um, but two quick questions before we go to the audience. One is, um, Heather, I want you to tell me briefly about how your group is trying to reimagine human capital on the balance sheet of companies, because this matters again to this audience, and look at it not so much as a cost, but an asset. Can you say a few words about that? And then, Jean, I want you to say briefly um, whether or not you think it matters. That, I mean, the reason I say, with all deep respect for Bob Rubin, because I think he's done amazing stuff in Service of America, but you know, he, his was a tribe that had very close ties to Wall Street, and so this group here knew what they were thinking much more easily. Heather's tribe, dare I say it, come from a very different career background. They're not former Goldman Sachs people. So for the most part, the reason why you don't know them is because they have a different educational professional background. I'd like Eugene to say a few words about that and whether you think that matters or not. But anyway, tell us about human capital first, and then we're going to turn to the audience for questions. Well, so the president starts from the premise that investing in people and places are the best investments we can make. And um, I mean, there's there's a variety of different you know, ways that he has shown that through his policy. Um, you know, if the many of the tax credits that we're giving, for example, for clean energy, uh, encourage firm, they don't require it, but you'll get a bonus in your tax credit if you, um, if you follow prevailing wage and you give apprenticeships for workers, if you value those workers. Um, but one of the cruxes of that is that we know in markets that if your competitor is paying someone a fair wage, it's a lot easier for you to pay a fair wage. And so um, what you need to be thinking about are policies that government is doing writ large that encourage a level playing field, that uh, encourage a race to the top, that don't encourage firms to be competing just on wages or just on you know um, environmental degradation, You know, not worrying about the costs of what they're doing, but that you are focused on um, making sure that we're creating that race to the top. And through that, you're going to get a better supply of workers, workers that are able to, um, they'll have the resources and the time and the energy to invest in their own human capital and their children's. You're going to see a, a more um, uh, stable and um, skilled supply of talent. One of the things that is most frustrating to me in this job is uh, how often people ask me, well, Heather, where are the workers going to come from? We're, you know, we're at low unemployment. You're talking about all these investments. Where are the workers going to come from? And one of the answers is, is that, well, you know, we're talking about job quality. We're not, we're not, this isn't a stimulus. We're not creating jobs immediately. We're creating a pathway for jobs over the next decade. And we're creating good jobs. And people are going to be moving out of some industries and into others. So there's a, a net job jobs issue. But the other thing is that part of what we did when we allowed our country to be deindustrialized is that we then met, it then meant that for those firms that were left, the talent pools got smaller and smaller because why would you invest in um, those kinds of jobs in manufacturing or construction when there weren't enough jobs available? In doing this, we're creating that strong demand signal. And what you're actually seeing, the vast, the, not vast, but the majority of workers in this country don't have a four-year college degree. And we're creating jobs for workers and pipelines and talent pools and acknowledging the skills in that labor and, um, and all that comes from it. And let me end on just one small thing. One of the things I've noticed uh, post-pandemic is how many of us in rooms like this talk about how wonderful it is that we're able to come together again and how much we learn from this collaboration in our communities of practice and being able to work face to face. And some of what's underlying our theory of the case on human capital is that all kinds of workers do better when they have a, a sufficient community of practice. And so creating these ecosystems for industries to thrive helps create those conditions in communities um, for that kind of talent pool. And it's it's going to benefit us in higher productivity. Right. Well, I, Jean, I, so yeah. quickly you, and then we're going to turn to the audience for questions. And I say there's some roving mics. Do, do wave when we come to questions, um, your hand. Well, I would try to characterize you myself as a, a you know, bipartisan figure. Uh, having come out of the Clinton administration, yes, but let's think about it as bipartisan. If I take a poll today in this audience, I will bet that on the issues that matter economically, we agree on 95% of the issues. I, I would 
be virtually certain. And one of the things that we're not taking enough advantage of, and you mentioned this with Trump, is that we, we build at best on the shoulders of each new generation. And we learn from the past generation. So they get, that gets me to the defense of our buddy Bob. Many in the room are friends of Bob Rubin. I'm yeah. certainly one. What, what we learned during that administration is the importance of practicality and markets and using markets and using practical business solutions as opposed to simply, you know, academically, as much as I love academia, academically created frameworks that may or may not work. If there's one thing that we did learn that didn't work out as well as one would have hoped and, it, and taken to the extreme it is that global free markets need some level of regulation as distinct from simply completely the wild woolly west in global free markets. And so there's some tailoring which is now taking place that, that makes sense in terms of taking that pendulum and making sure it doesn't swing too far. I think one of the dangers we face going forward in terms of what I'll call the new industrialization is that we don't go so far in terms of a reindustrialization in this country that we do create international tensions that we can't control. And uh, so in the, in the um, Rubin years, let's call them, really the Clinton years, um, there was an attempt to both reach out internationally using mm -hmm. our power in terms of markets and practicality. Remember, we have the, the greatest companies on earth even today. Yes, there's been some trimming back here and there, but we got them. Um, and, uh, and that's certainly true in technology. Um, but how do we basically get a better balance? And I think what Heather's uh, you know, focusing on is a better balance, building on the shoulders of Republicans and Democrats and past administrations to basically get a better balance for America as to where we are today. And what they're trying to do is critical. And as I say, I am confident if we took a poll in this room, we would find 95% agreement. Oh. No, I'd agree. Um, well, I'm a great believer, just to be geeky and academic myself, in the Hegelian dialectic, where progress advanced through thesis, antithesis, and then synthesis. Um, you know, you have pendulum swings that go back and forth, and I think that's where we are at the moment. But anyway, questions, one in the back straight away. Um, and it would be courteous but not compulsory to briefly identify yourself. Since we only have eight minutes, please be very, very short. Hi. Is this on? Yeah. Richard Reeves, currently the Brookings <laughs> Institution, shortly to be at the American Institute for Boys and Men. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure bill creates mostly jobs for working class Americans, but two thirds of those will be men. From an anthropological, political and economic perspective, is that good news that it's so pro-male or bad news? What an interesting question. Wow. Over to Hi, you, Heather. Hi, Richard. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Fancy you would ask that question. Um, so this is a big question. I mean, I think so. First of all, um, certainly the administration is doing everything uh, we can to make sure that those jobs are available to all. So there's a lot of work. You know, that's what registered apprenticeships are about. What it's um, making sure that we are implementing with an eye to equity and openness, um, and that certainly women are welcome in those jobs as well. Um, but you know, we have seen in this country a decline in um, employment in both men and women uh, uh, relative to our economic competitors. Certainly this has been a challenge for, for male workers. And so uh, it is a good thing that we're creating those jobs. Um, and we know that you know people exist in economic units that are, you know, that have men and women. We exist in families uh, often. And um, so creating good jobs for one part of a family can also benefit the whole family uh, overall. I will add that you know we have had fulsome investments um, proposed, and certainly they've not gotten through Congress, but the president has done more to advance making sure that women's jobs are good jobs as well. And so there is a, uh, there, uh, men and women tend to work in different kinds of jobs. So if you're taking a sectoral strategy, you do need to be thinking about the, those different sectors. Well, uh, child care, child care, child care. Yeah. One thing we're not doing, I mean, didn't, didn't get enough uh, uh, political support in this country, is exactly what they're doing in Japan. The number one item for the Japanese administration right now is child care in Japan. So Japan is able to unlock the talent of its uh, female population. It's a brilliant strategy. It's exactly what they should be doing in Japan. It is the, I talked to the, the senior people in the Japanese government. It's their number one priority. We ought to be doing more of it here. We certainly Absolutely. Should. Yes. Um, we got a question in the front row, and then the lady there, and then the lady back there. So again, 
Let's try and get three questions in, but all very brief. Right. Thank, thank, thanks so much. Um, question about Jean's last point on balance. Uh, the America first, Trump policy, Trump tariffs, how do we find the balance between investing in the strategic interests of our country without alienating the world, without having language and, ter and trade policy that divides us and perhaps puts us in a trap of repeating protectionist policies of the past that will, that will create war and conflict? Right. That's a profound question. I mean, after all, what World War II was created in a lot of ways by economic disequilibrium as much as there were other uh, issues. And Smoot-Hawley, the tariff thing separating, was a, was a major bad decision. And we, we run that risk. Uh, it's going to take a lot of skill on the part of this administration and whatever the next administration is, whether it's Biden, Trump, or whoever, whoever is the next president. Right. Uh, to basically thread that needle. But you're right in pointing this out because it is a critically important needle. And we're seeing the tensions, right? The Chinese think we hate them, that we're trying to close them down. The uh, Russians have played on that in terms of the uh, you know, uh, uh, kind yeah. of concord ant they have. Very dangerous. And you're right to beat that drum because that is a very important drum. Heather. And yet, trade with China hasn't fallen. So we've had, we've had the biggest the biggest trade last year, the trade deficit. I don't remember exactly what the number is, but we're, it's still going up. But we continue to trade with China. We are not um, we are not decoupling with China. We have not um, embarked on the kinds of policies that the Trump administration has embarked on. Our policies are investing along the innovation to commercialization pathway. We are pursuing both demand and supply side policies. Um, we are uh, encouraging firms to invest in the United States, but those in, those tax credit investments that people seem to all be talking about, those are bonuses. It's a little ten. It's a, not little, but it's a ten percent bonus on top of a whole other range of tax credits that businesses can get for making investments. But if they do it, you know, in a, uh, uh, here in the United States, and that is that. That is not a bludgeon of raising tariffs. These are well-crafted, smart policies that are going to encourage investment, and quite frankly, in something that we need to be encouraging investment in globally. So I think so. I think we need to unpack where it is that we are um, encouraging domestic production, and um, uh, and how we're actually doing that uh, on the clean energy side, and. On the international side, my colleagues over at the NSC, you know, Jake Sullivan just gave a major um, talk a couple of weeks ago. Um, they have been so focused on making sure that we're creating that new trading regime that benefits us and our allies and that we're coming to it with a new lens. I mean, and remember that our average tariff rate is like 2.5% or something. We, uh, they did all, like they, the, the pat, prior administrations did all the work to lower tariffs. Now we are making sure that the negative externalities on labor, on the environment, on emissions are being accounted for. We, but we are still working so closely with our allies on this. And I could go on, right. but I know I want to get another question. I want to get the last question back there. The lady back there, I think, who put her hand up. Yep. I think this will sadly have to be the last question. I'm very sorry. Hi. Um, Briefly. I'm Lisa I'm Lisa Gevelber. I work at Google, and we have been um, training and certifying people without college degrees for high-paying tech jobs in cybersecurity, data analytics, IT. We've actually just recently announced we've graduated a half million people in the last two years, and we're seeing some really good employer uptake of hiring these people without traditional uh, credentials. I love what they're doing in the state of Ohio and the state of Texas. I feel like they're getting their act together about really embracing these. What's the federal government going to do to incentivize employers to embrace these alternative credentials and not apprenticeships? That's fascinating what you just said. It'd be worth a session in itself, but yes. And not Are you going to work with Google to take this, take this national? <laughs> I think that's the subtext of the question. It's a great question. I mean, I, I don't know enough about what Google's doing to be able to answer that, but we are certainly working across the administration to um, encourage firms to invest in um, uh, in training. We are encouraging them to invest in apprenticeships. Uh, we're encouraging them to partner with unions. We know that one of the best ways in many of these occupations, um, the best training programs are run by unions, um, and that partnership can be incredibly um, helpful. Um, but, it, but you know, one of the president's core values is that we do need to be making sure that we're creating those pathways 
supplies. And I will note that it's really important that we create the supply of those workers, but we, we believe just as importantly, you have to create the demand. Because if you create that demand, if you create those good jobs, that will create the incentive for people to get the training they need to go into those jobs. So we're, we're, we're working on both sides of that. Right. Well, thank you. Well, I know there's a lot of people who want to ask questions. I'm sorry if we've not been able to take you on board. Um, we are sadly out of time. It's been fascinating. I'll just say one last thing, which is that I think in 10 years' time, when we look back at this moment and the last few years, I think that we will see a shift of the economic pendulum on a par with the shift around Reagan and Thatcher and the rise of liberal economics and the rise of free market thinking. We don't yet have a name for it. Um, it's not yet clear exactly what direction that's going to take. Um, it's worth remembering that when Thatcher and Reagan came in, nobody had a clue about what they were about to unveil. That only became clear after several years, and there wasn't a name for that either. So my last point is, whoever thinks up a name, whether right or left, <laughs> put your hand up, tell Heather, and you may yet have a place in history. So thanks to all of you.